Track Twenty, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Ruth Golding, Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Len Holster, make a smokestack Jones. Track twenty. The second epoch, ten, June twentieth, eight o'clock. The sun is shining in a clear sky. I have not been near my bed. I have not once closed my weary, wakeful eyes. From the same window at which I looked out into the darkness of last night, I look out now at the bright stillness of the morning. I count the hours that have passed since I escaped to the shelter of this room by my own sensations, and those hours seem like weeks. How short a time, and yet how long to me, since I sank down in the darkness here on the floor, drenched to the skin, cramped in every limb, cold to the bones, a useless, helpless, panic-stricken creature. I hardly know when I roused myself. I hardly know when I groped my way back to the bedroom and lighted the candle, and searched, with a strange ignorance at first of where to look for them, for dry clothes to warm me. The doing of these things is in my mind, but not the time when they were done. Can I even remember when the chilled, cramped feeling left me, and the throbbing heat came in its place? Surely it was before the sun rose? Yes, I heard the clock strike three. I remember the time by the sudden brightness and clearness, the feverish strain and excitement of all my faculties which came with it. I remember my resolution to control myself, to wait patiently hour after hour, till the chance offered of removing Laura from this horrible place without the danger of immediate discovery and pursuit. I remember the persuasion settling itself in my mind that the words those two men had said to each other would furnish us not only with our justification for leaving the house, but with our weapons of defence against them as well. I recall the impulse that awakened in me to preserve those words in writing exactly as they were spoken while the time was my own, and while my memory vividly retained them. All this I remember plainly. There is no confusion in my head yet. The coming in here from the bedroom with my pen and ink and paper before sunrise. The sitting down at the widely opened window to get all the air I could to cool me. The ceaseless writing faster and faster, hotter and hotter, driving on more and more wakefully all through the dreadful interval before the house was astir again. How clearly I recall it from the beginning by candlelight to the end on the page before this, in the sunshine of the new day. Why do I sit here still? Why do I weary my hot eyes and my burning head by writing more? Why not lie down and rest myself, and try to quench the fever that consumes me in sleep? I dare not attempt it. A fear beyond all other fears has got possession of me. I am afraid of this heat that parches my skin. I am afraid of the creeping and throbbing that I feel in my head. If I lie down now, how do I know that I may have the sense and the strength to rise again? Oh, the rain, the rain, the cruel rain that chilled me last night! Nine o'clock! Was it nine struck, or eight? Nine, surely! I am shivering again, shivering from head to foot in the summer air. Have I been sitting here asleep? I don't know what I have been doing. Oh, my God, am I going to be ill? Ill at such a time as this? My head! I am sadly afraid of my head. I can write, but the lines all run together. I see the words. Laura, 
I can write Laura and see I write it. Eight or nine, which was it? So cold, so cold. Oh, that rain last night. And the strokes of the clock, the strokes I can't count, keep striking in my head. Note. At this place the entry in the diary ceases to be legible. The two or three lines which follow contain fragments of words only, mingled with blots and scratches of the pen. The last marks on the paper bear some resemblance to the first two letters, L and A, of the name of Lady Glyde. On the next page of the diary another entry appears. It is in a man's handwriting, large, bold, and firmly regular, and the date is June the 21st. It contains these lines. Postscript by a sincere friend. The illness of our excellent Miss Halcombe has afforded me the opportunity of enjoying an unexpected intellectual pleasure. I refer to the perusal of which I have just completed of this interesting diary. There are many hundred pages here. I can lay my hand on my heart and declare that every page has charmed, refreshed, delighted me. To a man of my sentiments, it is unspeakably gratifying to be able to say this. Admirable woman, I allude to Miss Halcombe. Stupendous effort, I refer to this diary. Yes, these pages are amazing. The tact which I find here, the discretion, the rare courage, the wonderful power of memory, the acute observation of the character, the easy grace of style, the charming outbursts of womanly feeling have all inexpressibly increased my admiration of this sublime creature, of this magnificent Marian. The presentation of my own character is masterly in the extreme. I certify with my whole heart to the fidelity of the portrait. I feel how vivid an impression I must have produced to have been painted in such strong, such rich, such massive colors as these. I lament afresh the cruel necessity which sets our interests at variance and opposes us to each other. Under happier circumstances, how worthy I would have been of Miss Halcombe! How worthy Miss Halcombe would have been of me! The sentiments which animate my heart assure me that the lines I have just written express a profound truth. These sentiments exalt me above all merely personal considerations. I bear witness, in the most disinterested manner, to the excellence of the stratagem by which this unparalleled woman surprised the private interview between Percival and myself, also to the marvellous accuracy of her report of the whole conversation from its beginning to its end. These sentiments have induced me to offer to the unimpressionable doctor who attends on her my vast knowledge of chemistry and my luminous experience of the more subtle research which medical and magnetic science have placed at the disposal of mankind. He has hitherto declined to avail himself of my assistance, miserable man. Finally, those sentiments dictate the lines grateful sympathetic paternal lines which appear in his place. I close the book. My strict sense of propriety restores it by the hands of my wife to its place in the writer's table. Events are hurrying me away. Circumstances are guiding me to serious issues. Vast perspectives of success are on the road themselves before my eyes. I accomplish my destiny with a calmness which is terrible to myself. Nothing but the homage of my admiration is my own. I deposit it with the respectful tenderness at the feet of Miss Halcombe. I breathe my wishes for her recovery. I condole with her on the inevitable failure of every plan that she has formed for her sister's benefit. At the same time, I entreat her to believe that the information which I have derived from her diary will in no respect to help me to contribute to that failure. It simply confirms the plan of conduct which I had previously arranged. I have to thank these pages for awakening the finest sensibilities in my nature. Nothing more. 
To a person of similar sensibility, this simple assertion will explain and excuse everything. Miss Alcombe is a person of similar sensibility. In that persuasion, I sign myself, Fosco. End of Track 20